Did you know that there are healing edible plants growing on your lawn, in your garden, and in your local park, plant friend? They are being branded as weeds or undesirables, but they can open up a world of fun for us. We walk on top of them as we go to our mailboxes in the morning. We park our cars on top of them or trample on top of them as we hike. But yes, these medicinal, healing, natural, and free plants are waiting to be enjoyed by us in salads, in salves, and everything in between. However, Foraging, finding plants in the wild to eat, is a very intimidating thing because they have poisonous doppelgangers that can wreak havoc on our GI tracts. So you need education, source references, and a base understanding and knowledge before moving forward. And today's episode is all about taking the first step in your foraging and medicinal plant journey through our interview with a new plant friend of mine, herbalist, forager, author, and hiker, Heather Housekeeper, on the basics of how to forage for medicinal plants that are growing, quote unquote, like weeds right under our nose. Welcome. Welcome to the Growing Joy podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives. I'm Maria, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, an epic plant killer turned happy plant lady. On Growing Joy, you'll find conversations about plant care, plant community, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Plant friends! Hello, welcome to the Growing Joy with Plants podcast. If you're new here, hi, I'm Maria, your new best plant friend. And here on the Growing Joy podcast, we help you learn to care for plants successfully, but more importantly, cultivate more joy in your life by doing that. And if you're an old plant friend of mine, a longtime listener of the show, welcome back. I'm so happy that you're here and I'm so honored that you choose to show up to this amazing program on a weekly basis. Today's episode is no joke. It is so fun. And it's an episode that I did in person with my new plant friend, Heather, an amazing herbalist that I recently met on my birthday overnight at the lodge at Woodlock. She has the most impressive knowledge of native and medicinal plants that I have ever met. Plant friends, we go so deep in this conversation. And there's a video component to this, which I'll tell you about in a second that I don't normally do for my podcasts. But before we do that, I want to give a couple of disclaimers. Number one, This episode is all about being outside, so I thought it would be fun to do the interview with Heather outside. You're going to enjoy the birds singing. You're going to enjoy our natural surroundings. However, in the last third of the interview, the lawnmower guy came, so Heather and I had to move to finish the interview, so you might have the sound quality change right at the end, but hang in there because the conversation is so good. And second, Please proceed at your own risk. This episode is not meant to be your like one-stop shop. After you listen to this, you can go forage medicinal plants easily. Obviously, this is a very visual practice. It's why we've created visual counterpoints. Heather gives a lot of resources. So this episode is meant to inspire you and give you like your first step on a guide towards foraging. I highly recommend you go to Heather's amazing other resources that we talk about today in the episode to continue. Proceed at your own risk. But I have a feeling you're going to feel very inspired after today. So Heather is an herbalist. Like I said, she was teaching a class on medicinal plants when I was at the Lodge at Woodlock for my birthday weekend. It's an amazing nature spa and resort. She is amazing. She is actually coincidentally a graduate of the Chestnut School of Herbal Medicine, whose founder was also a guest on our show for the Herbalism 101 episode, Juliet Blankenspore. She has a certificate in herbal medicine, plant identification, and medicine making. She's an avid hiker. She's an author of multiple books. She's amazing. I'm going to let her introduce herself to you. But before that, as I'm introducing you to my new plant friend, I wanted to give a shout out to some new plant friends who have joined our Garden Society. Welcome Raya M, Patty L, and Brandy R. I hope you know, but I have a online algorithm and troll-free platform for our listeners to connect, to make new plant friends, propagate their knowledge, and grow more joy in their life. And we have new additions to this platform. I've been recording many courses that we've been releasing exclusively to the members of the Garden Society on, I'm calling it the Plant Killer to Plant Person Crash Course. So there was a mini course released on lighting, understanding light for your plants last month. And this month we've released a course on water. So if you ever struggle with how to water your plants or understanding bright and direct light, go join and you'll get those courses as part of your membership. 
Also, joining is an amazing way to support our community. It helps me cover the costs for the business that I run to help make these episodes for you. It helps support the editors and stuff of the show. So thanks in advance. And welcome to our newest members. Thank you for supporting the show. I can't wait to get to know you better in the platform. But anyway, we've got to dive into this episode because it's so good. But I want to let you know that the hour before Heather and I did this interview, she came over to my house. My friend came over and recorded Heather walking me around my lawn and identifying 10 different medicinal plants that are categorized as weeds. We've edited those videos down to social media reels. Go check out my Instagram, Growing Joy with Maria, to get visuals, short form videos on all of these different plants. So if this episode gets you inspired and you want to see what we're talking about, check out my Instagram for all of the content that I'm going to be releasing over the next two weeks about this episode. Okay, without further ado, here's Heather. Okay, Heather, welcome to Growing Joy. Thank you, Maria. We've spent the entire day together already. I'm so excited to have you here for a conversation. You know, I've wanted to do more foraging episodes before, but I've been scared because it's like, how do you do an episode that's so visual by audio? And after I met you, I was like, I found the solution. (laughs) Yay. Yay. So I was lucky enough to get to take one of your herbalism classes. Was it herbalism or foraging? Foraging. It was your foraging class at Woodlock Lodge. Wait, why can't I say it? (laughs) The Lodge at Woodlock. And I suppose I should also say it was so it's a little bit of herbalism and foraging. Yes. Mixed up. Mixed into So shout out to Woodlock. Thank you very much for introducing me to Heather. And you know, you're such an interesting mixture of herbalist expertise, hiking expertise. You're like the perfect foraging instructor, right? Because you really have both sides. I think a lot of people are scared to learn how to forage. They're scared to get into herbalism because they're scared they're not going to pick the right plants. They're accidentally going to poison themselves. They don't know how to get started with plant ID. So today's episode is going to be a beautiful general kind of introduction we're going to warmly invite people to kind of dip their toe in the pond of herbalism and foraging. So for those listening, do you want to give us a brief intro to how you became the botanical hiker? (laughs) Sure, sure. So it's kind of a winding path. Yes, obviously. Um, (laughs) Like like all the best stories are. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, I have just always had a love for nature. And I've always felt called to deepen that relationship with nature. And the best way that I could figure out to do that many years ago, back when, let's see, about 15 years ago or so, was to hike the Appalachian Trail from beginning to end. Yeah, casual, very casual. <laughs> I thought if I hike from Georgia to Maine, surely I will connect all the more with my surroundings, with, with Mother Earth. And so I set out and I did just that. And it was an amazing five and a half months experience out in the wilderness. And I did connect with place with where I was hiking through. However, at the same time, I didn't magically just know all the names of the plants at the end of the hike. And and honestly, you know, I started out on that hike not knowing much more than the difference between an oak and a maple. So you weren't an herbalist. I was not an herbalist. And you know, I was a yoga teacher. I had managed uh, for a couple of years a health food store. So I learned a lot there. But no, I was not an herbalist. But I aspired to at least be able to identify and work with plants for food and medicine. But that still seemed like completely out of out of the realm of possibility. But so, yeah, somehow I thought hiking the Appalachian Trail, I would just, mad, the names would just, would, the trees would tell me themselves. Um, and that did not happen. And I also thought that it was ironic that I'd been out in the wilderness for five and a half months, but I was still completely reliant upon the grocery stores in towns, the local pharmacy, you know, in these tiny towns, should I not feel well? And I thought, surely all the food and medicine I need is all around me. I just don't know how to identify it nor use it. So after I hiked the Appalachian Trail, I enrolled in herbal medicine school. 
And that was at the Chestnut School of Herbal Medicine. Yes, another <laughs> guest on our podcast, yes. Julia Blankensport, Herbalism Shout 101. Shout out to Julia. Shout out Julia. So I didn't even realize that, that you had studied with her when I met you. And I think I had like just interviewed her when we met. So what a beautiful kind of divine overlap. Yeah, really cool. Juliet's amazing. She is amazing. So what did that school, like how long was that studying experience? Yeah. So that was about a 10 month program. And we met in person, I believe it was two days a week, most always out in the field somewhere. So that could be the woods, that could be a meadow, that could be, you know, in her garden or in a botanical park. And then we had three seven to 10 day field trips that were completely out in the wilderness in which we would just spend our days identifying plants and um, harvesting plants and weaving them into our meals. And, and that was exactly what I wanted to learn how to do. And so her program was the foundation of my knowledge and so I took all that, that wisdom that she had shared, and then I hit my next trail. And that's, that's often what happens when you hike a long distance trail. You, you think, you think, okay, I'm done. I can check that off my bucket list. But a lot of us just get this bug and you just keep on hey, hiking. Don't. Yeah, I'm like, I, that is so far from me and my expertise and interests, but I have so much respect for it. Because you've done the Appalachian this book that I got of yours is The Finger Lakes. Correct. And then have, how many others have you done? So after the Appalachian Trail, I did the Mountains to Sea Trail, which right. is North Carolina's long distance trail that goes from the Smokies to the Outer Banks. Which you also have a book on. I do. So that okay. was my first book. Okay. That was my first book. And you know, I wanted to take the knowledge that I'd learned in her program and apply it. Mm -hmm. And see, okay, well, now can I hike into completely new areas and identify the plants and mm -hmm. put them to use? And, and I did also want to be able to broaden my knowledge and share that with, with others. So again, I thought, well, a three month hike on the mountains of the sea trail should do that. And it sure, it sure did. I mean, oh my gosh, what I have learned on my long hikes, just being out there, observing the plants, documenting what I see, what I smell, what I feel with the plants. And oftentimes with no more than the assistance of a guidebook, a plant key to identify, you know, this was back when I hiked the mountains to sea trail, even that was before any apps existed. I mean, right. that's a very new, very new addition to the botanical world. Yeah, so yeah. I'd be out there with my Newcomb's plant guide, which I'll bring up, we can bring up that name again, identifying <laughs> the plants, you know, squatting down, taking 30 30 minutes sometimes, 40 right. minutes to figure out each plant. Those but stakes then, are much higher too, that you can't like give it a quick Google or something, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. But then also in the process, you commit it to your memory yes. and you understand what the identifying traits are then. And we're not reliant upon this, basically a crutch, yep. you know, to tell us what it is. Yeah. And we don't know why. And we don't recall it. We were just talking about that. So Everyone, this is a part Instagram, part podcast collaboration because we needed to make some visuals for everyone listening. So Heather and I just spent the last hour and a half on my property walking around foraging, learning so much. All that information and plant idea is going to be on the Instagram. But we're just talking about that because the first time I tasted lamb sorrel. Sheep sorrel. Sorry, sheep sorrel. <laughs> something fuzzy. But mature right. lamb. Yes, mature lamb. <laughs> sheep sorrel. The taste of sheep sorrel is so surprising and so citrusy. It totally like blew my mind. And now I feel like of all the plants that we looked at as we've been walking on my land, I'm seeing the sorrel pop out so much more because I feel like I had that in the field experience of, okay, let me taste this leaf. Holy shit. What is this explosion in my mouth? Yeah. I need more of it. Okay, that's sorrel, even though I'm confusing lamb and sheep. And now I feel like I'll never mix that up again either. You will, you will. Um, but yeah, I do think there's that practical application and that like real time experience. The sensory experience. Yeah, you can read so many books about medicinal plants. And I have five books on medicinal plants on mm. my bookshelf, but it's really only when I'm with you walking around my property where I'm actually able to ID and taste and understand more. So you did that trail. You wrote your first book, which is 
categorizing the different plants up along that trail. Right. The edible medicinal plants. And then Finger and Lakes so is then, next. Yeah. So I hiked the Mountain to Sea Trail twice uh-huh. because I enjoyed it so much. Wow. And then I hiked the Finger Lakes Trail, wrote my second book about the edible and medicinal plants that can be found along that trail. Wow. And the plants that are cataloged in, in both of those books can really be found like throughout the eastern United States. I'd like to at some point compile the information from both of those and just yeah make an eastern United States a foraging guide. But after I did the Finger Lakes Trail, I did the Long Path, and that was my first long hike with a partner. Uh, so Your my third romantic book. partner, yes. yes, my third book, Love and the Long Path. So that was not a plant guide; that was a narrative of our journey with a lot of uh, plants woven throughout. So we did continue to use the plants. I don't know how not to work with the plants now and appreciate the plants along our way. And I've just continued to hike. Yeah, he, my partner, he joined me on the Florida Trail after that, which was a very different experience, entirely different plants. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like walking into a jungle, stepping but- onto yeah, like an alien world. Yeah. Um, but I learned a lot and we had an incredible experience. And after that, the Mid-State Trail. Oh, my is, God. Uh, Pennsylvania's long distance trail. And, and now I'm turning my attention to the Tuscarora Trail. Wow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's incredible. Well, I love that you use the books as a way for you to even just document your experience. Like, Absolutely. yeah, it's beautiful. Man, I have so many questions. So and when you're hiking these trails, are you making full meals off of what you're finding on the trails or you're using the stuff that you're finding on the trail as supplementary? So I'm, I'm weaving them in to my basic backpacker foods. Yeah. Yeah. So it is not realistic to try and survive entirely off of what you find and gather and still hike 10 to 15 miles right, a day. Right, that's so many calories that you need. Uh, that would be so many calories. Yeah. You'd spend most of your day gathering. And, you know, where there are nuts in the autumn, you know, so there is a protein source, but you're just not going to get the diversity of nutrients that you need hiking within one small season without having some kind of preserved foods or cultivated foods. Yeah. Hunting. Well, I think <laughs> Which I'm vegetarian, so that's not going to happen. Yeah. No, I think <laughs> it's interesting too, because there's this like very interesting kind of experience that I think a lot of us go through is I see this also in my community with homesteading. It's like you think that in order to homestead, you need to have multiple acres of land where you have cows and sheep and alpaca and chickens and compost and whatever. But really, you could start with a compost bin and a chicken. You don't even need the chicken, right? Like this extreme of, okay, I'm going to forage, but I'm going to go forage my whole meal. You know, like alone, Billy and my favorite TV show. I was going to say, this. you don't have to be on an episode Exactly. You, you don't have to be on an episode of Alone. <laughs> but this experience, it sounds like through understanding the plans, through weaving them through your backpacker meals connects you to the land more and Absolutely. connects you to the experience more and is empowering and enriching and why the hell not? And for our community, as we love connecting to our gardens and our houseplants, like the thing that's blowing my mind is, you know, Heather and I just spent literally an hour on my lawn. We didn't go 50 feet on my lawn, <laughs> right? right? And you had identified four or five plants that I could be throwing in our salads or I could be making a tea with, you know, we found a plant that's great for coughs and Billy just had a cough, you know, a really bad cough that's better now. But, you know, I thought, oh my God, if I only knew this, you know, a week ago, not to say that we're also not going to give Billy cough medicine, but like, why not go outside and get the plant that helps with the cough Absolutely. and then also whatever medicine he needs. So I do think like, at least for me personally, foraging feels very intimidating, very overwhelming and it doesn't need to be. You can really just start with identifying one plant and Absolutely. having that one sorrel, holy shit, this leaf tastes like <laughs> lemon, what, what's going on moment. That's going to make you so excited. And then that plant will be the gateway to all the others. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so let's talk about foraging 101. For our newbies who are foraging curious, what do they need to know? What do we need to know when trying to make foraging our new hobby? Yeah, so basic botany for proper plant identification. So that is first and foremost. 
You want to know what details to really zone in on to properly identify a plant. We can't just take a mental image of looking at a plant once or twice and then assume that we will recognize that plant accurately again when we encounter it. We need to know to look for uh, how are the leaves arranged along the flowering stalk? How many petals does it have? Is it a regular or an irregular flower? And we can get into some of those, some of those terms. But Really being able to firmly identify a plant, preferably using a plant identification key, is first and foremost for safety purposes. Imagine that beautiful harmony wafting its way through your lawn and garden this year. Or better yet, gifting the glorious experience of a Wind River chime to a loved one. So every time they hear it sing, they think of you. Hands down, one of the best things Billy and I ever did for our mindfulness practices in 2023 is hang Wind River chimes on either side of our house. They sing in the wind throughout the day, and every time they do, their melodies are an invitation to stop what we're doing take a deep breath, and drop back into the present. Not to mention, they just make me smile because they sound so dang pretty. We joke that our house feels like a spa. (laughs) Today, Wind River wants to use their ad time to gift you a mindful moment with their chimes, so please enjoy. Let's take a big breath in. Hold it. Exhale. Another big breath. Hold it and exhale again. The chimes are so magical, and not only do they sound magical, but the company is magical. The Wind River Chimes is rooted in service. For chimes purchased on windriverchimes.com, they donate 20% of the purchase price to charity each month. 20% to charity. So friends, get yourself or your loved one a chime for your next birthday, your next wedding to celebrate, a memorial, and when you use the code GROWINGJOY at windriverchimes.com, you'll get a free engraving on any engravable wind chime to add a special element to your gift. They come in a variety of colors, sizes, and sounds, so head to windriverchimes.com to listen, and don't forget to use code GROWINGJOY at checkout to receive a free engraving. windriverchimes.com, code GROWINGJOY at checkout. Okay, so let's talk keys. If I want to get a key that I'm going to use, are there things that I should look for in the key to make sure that this is going to be the thing that's really going to support me? Yeah. So look for a key that is applicable to your region. So that's going to be the most important. A key that is for the Northeastern United States is not necessarily going to apply to the Southwestern United States. And, And make certain that it is a key. So not necessarily just a guide where you're going to page through and see if the plants match up to the pictures. Okay. But a key is basically a tool in which your book is going to ask you a series of questions. And through the process of deduction of answering each of those questions, you are eventually going to reach with certainty what plant you have in front of you. And you're going to know why, because you've answered all of these questions. So More general plant identification books are fabulous too, but you really want to be able to key out that plant first and then look to the more general plant identification books to flesh out more information. And the key out is, does this plant have heart-shaped leaves or, you know, all those fancy terms that we're going to talk about, (laughs) Um, but it's identifying leaf shape, leaf structure, flower structure, if you see the flower. Because I will say, you know, another thing that I learned today, when I first met you on my birthday, I said, we're dandelion farmers. We have so many dandelions. It's crazy on my property. And you came today and we realized, Yes, we're dandelion farmers. We have a lot of dandelions, but we actually have a lot of hawkweed, Mm -hmm. which looks Mm -hmm. just like a dandelion. And I'm lucky that you've explained to me that hawkweed doesn't, it can't poison you, but there's no medicinal benefits to it. So I might have been thinking that I have a dandelion, 
by a basic photo where the flowers are almost identical. But because I didn't take a look at the leaves, which is really how you can tell them apart, how you taught me, go watch the Instagram video if you're curious to see. We took a great video on how to differentiate the two. You know, I could just be making dandelion fritters with hawkweed and not (laughs) enjoying the benefits of the dandelion, right? right? Wondering why they taste so strange. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's very important. So looking for a key and not just a picture book. Even though pictures are helpful. And pictures are absolutely helpful. I mean, my book is full of color photos and mine is not a plant key. However, it uses those same botanical terms through its descriptions so that you are basically matching up the description with the plant in front of you. So even though mine is not a formal plant key, it's still going to say this plant has to have opposite leaves. This plant has to have only three petals. This plant has to have an irregular flower. So there are, you know, different guides for different purposes. But the takeaway is know some basic botanical terms so you you can properly identify the plant in front of you and discern it from potentially toxic lookalikes. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we've got our key. We've got our key. We've done our research for some botanical terms. We're going to wear sunscreen, plant friends, or you're going to bring a hat. (laughs) Protect yourself. (laughs) Do you bring a magnifying glass or like, are there any other tools that you suggest people using? I mean, you didn't really bring any. Yeah. So if I were going to be identifying plants for the first time, a magnifying loop. And what that is, is a little magnifying glass. It's about 10 times magnification. Jewelers use them. So if you're looking for one online, that's sometimes just jewelers magnifier jeweler's loop is a good thing to look for and you do have to bring it right up to your eye and right up to the plant but then you can see if there are tiny little hairs on the stem or what the reproductive parts look like within the flower and sometimes we really do have to get that specific to detail to know what plant we have in front of us okay got it you had also mentioned stomata that are hard to see with our naked eye. Maybe if you can see them up, could you think you'd be able to see them up close? With Oh, that? absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I've got my little kit. I'm ready to go. How do you suggest going on your first foraging adventure? Mm, yeah. So consider the lands around you. So if you own your own home, your lawn, is the very best place to start. (laughs) As we just learned, I have so many medicinal plants in my lawn. It's crazy. Because you know, you know the history of that lawn. Yeah. Has it been treated with chemicals? Hopefully not. You know where the dog goes and does his or her business and where they don't. And you don't have to be concerned with the legality of, is it legal for me to harvest here or not? So there are many places in which it is not legal for us to harvest. And that does include some of our public lands. So like state parks, national parks are completely off limits. You know, city or county parks typically are too. When we get into the designation of forest, so national forest, state forest, that makes a big difference. And generally speaking, and I certainly cannot speak for all the regulations throughout the country, but generally speaking, those are places that will permit foraging for yourself or for your family, of course, with the exception of plants that are endangered or threatened. And that's another piece to be knowledgeable of before we go harvesting, perhaps even on our lawns. What are the endangered or threatened plants in your region? And make sure that you're not accidentally harvesting them. Right. And that's another reason for plant identification. So not only for your safety, but for the the safety of the plants. Yeah, Yeah. totally. You've spoken a couple of times offline about your approach to gratitude and appreciation for the plants. So if this is my first time and I'm going onto my lawn to like see what's around, how do you suggest approaching the plant and kind of communicating with the plant before you take it? Yeah. So I think it's important to create relationship with the plant before we even consider harvesting it. And what I mean by create relationship is to spend time with that plant, plant. It's like slow time. So sit and hang out with that plant and get a sensory understanding of that plant. Feel its leaves, stick your nose in its flower, take a, a sniff, notice what it feels like. And ideally, you know, notice that plant throughout the seasons so that you can see how it's changing throughout the seasons. And what you're 
doing in that is, is kind of twofold. So, you know, firstly, you're taking the time that's showing respect to this, this plant. We're also ideally acknowledging that this plant is a living being with value unto itself outside of any value that it may provide to us, that it has its own life. But we're also in seeing that plant throughout the seasons and taking all that time, we are really getting to know, getting to know that plant as well. So that's another way in which we can firm up our our identification. But I think it's really important as foragers or future foragers to not perceive the plants simply as something that we can use and take. But these are these are living beings and we need to respect them and approach them as such. You know, I'll often on a walk or a program, sometimes I'll I'll start introducing a plant, sharing about its identifying attributes. And inevitably someone blurts out, Oh, what's it good for? <laughs> what can I use it for? <laughs> and I like to just I'll get to that. But let's meet the plant first. And sometimes I don't even like to share the plant's name at first because sometimes once we apply a name to something, we decide we know it. And that's what it is. So sometimes it's an interesting exercise just to meet the plant through all of its unique characteristics and then share Okay, well, this is this is a dandelion. Right? Yeah, the sensory experience I think is interesting. I mean, you had me smelling so many plants today, and I do think scent, even with research for my book, I felt like scent is so underutilized and underappreciated with our relationship with nature because we're looking at the plants, we're eating the plants, but we're not necessarily really diving deeper on the smell mm-hmm. and crushing the leaf, taking the time to crush the leaf and see what it smells like. You know, I mm-hmm. thought that was really interesting. That was a blind spot you kind of revealed to me of my own that, you know, you were really having me smell almost everything we pulled, which I definitely don't naturally think to do unless it's my tomato plant. And then I will be burying my They smell so good. In those leaves. <laughs> okay. I appreciate that. So a brief moment of appreciation. When harvesting, what are good harvesting practices? So you found your sheep sorrel. Mm-hmm. You're so excited. You've tasted <laughs> the leaf. You've confirmed it. You've read it in your key. You understand that it's the right plant. What are the best harvesting practices, especially if you're not on your land and you're on public land and or so out of respect for other foragers, but also out of respect for the earth and that plant and that plant's ability to continue reproducing and growing even after you've harvested. Yeah. So again, it comes back to knowing your plant. So not only what plant do you have, but what is its life cycle? You know, do a little bit of research. Is it better to harvest after the plant has flowered and gone to seed so that it has dropped its seeds and those can go on to flourish and create new plants? Or is it fine to harvest before the plant has flowered and maybe is going to provide also better medicine or, or food? Also, take, take only what you need and have a plan to, to use. So it can be really easy when we're beginning in the foraging world to just get really excited. Oh, there's an edible or medicinal plant. I just, I'm going to harvest a whole bunch and I'll figure it out later. And then you get home and maybe you're intimidated by that medicine making process might be and you never quite get around to using that plant or you've harvested way more than you actually needed. So Think about what you need, which oftentimes can be a rather minimal amount of plant, how you're going to use it, and also what taking only from the plant that which you do need. So if all you are harvesting or all you're seeking are the leaves, maybe you can just take a couple leaves from each plant. There's no need to uproot the plant and take the root with it. And now you've ended the plant's life. Yeah. I had shared with you ramps are big where I live. And also in the city, ramps are huge for the two-week period that they're in season. And I have a friend who has like acres and acres of ramps as ground cover. Sounds it's heavenly. wild. <laughs> I mean, you walk into her forest and you smell the ramps. It's wild. Mm-hmm. So she had little girls. She was teaching them how to harvest. They harvest, you know, multiple five-gallon buckets without detriment to the plants because there's just so many, like it it was fine. She sent me home with what felt like 
a five gallon bucket of Rams. And in the moment I was so excited, then I got home and I was like, wait, I have to clean and process <laughs> all these ramps. Yeah, yeah, and exactly. I learned so much about ramps that day. I made butter. I made pickled ramps. I mm. made ramp pesto. I mean, I made all the ramp things. But I think it was a really important lesson for me to come home and be like, wait, I don't think I, I mean, she was she was forcing them on me. She had way too many. But <laughs> I was like, wow, this was excessive. And I think I could have left with a handful of ramps and been fine because they're also very pungent. And yes. Intense. Little goes a long way. <laughs> yes. But then also, you know, I had read up here ramps foraging is um, kind of a problem because people take too much and they have like a very long life cycle and it's very hard. If you harvest too much, you kind of like ruin the plants and it's important to plant them. So she actually was able to give me a bunch of bulbs that I then planted on my land, hopefully, so that I will have, you know, a little ramp patch as the years go by and, you know, we'll keep populating them. But I do think that it is interesting in that moment when you're foraging, you're like, oh, this is so exciting. I want to take, you know, I'm learning so much. I want to do this. And then you get home and you're like, oh my goodness. And just as you said, you planted some of those bulbs. So, you know, that's one way in which we can give back to the plants for what they're giving us. Just something else we want to think about, you know, not only acknowledging that this plant is a living being independent of our use, but it is giving its life or a part of itself for us. So what can we give back and express that gratitude? You know, whether that's verbally or planting some ramp bulbs from your five gallon buckets yes. or tucking some nearby seeds from from the plants that are in seed, you know, into the soil. Oh, that's interesting. So helping them move along Helping a bit. them move along. Yeah, yeah. I love that. And maybe those opportunities are not always there, but then we can just say thank you. I love that. So is there a rule of thumb for if I see a patch of, we'll just keep going back to sorrel because that's what I'm the most excited about. I see a patch of sorrel. Is there a certain amount of the plant that I should leave behind? Like, is there a good rule of thumb people should use in terms of how much they take in one moment? Yeah. So it's hard to give a rule, hard to give a rule of thumb because it is going to be different for each plant, for each community of plants. But, you know, with the sheep sorrel, we only harvested the leaves because that was all we needed. So we didn't uproot the plants. We didn't take the uh, flowering stalks or the seed stalks. You know, we were looking at a cluster, I'd say, of about three or four that looked like basil rosettes or uh, leafy collections of sheep sorrel. And I recommended that you take one of those. Yeah. So general rule is, you know, kind of no more than one third of the plants in front of you. But that's a very general rule. There will be exceptions to that. But given that you've got sheep sorrel all over your lawn. All over. It's not a big deal. If, we, yeah. if I took that whole colony, I'd still have plenty of and sheep sorrel. And that's another, if you hadn't spent all that time on your lawn, you might not know that you've got sheep sorrel everywhere. So that is another reason to get out and know the land from which you're harvesting from. And then that will give you a better understanding of how common it was wild. How common is this plant? That was wild. Um, <laughs> so wild. That's very helpful. So we talked about harvesting sustainably. I guess, should I pick five plants, learn about them, and then go look for them as I'm foraging? Or should I get on the trail, see a plant, and then try and use the key to identify it? Like, what comes first? Do you know what I mean? I would recommend the second okay. method. Yeah. It's really tricky to pick five plants out of a book yeah, and then actually walk into the right ecosystem and, and find, them. find them. <laughs> Super. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if you go out onto your lawn or the you know nearby trail and take your plant key and identify several, then you can research further in a book like mine or in many, many other sources, the internet. Using Google, though, if you do go online, Google with the scientific name. So that's another little piece of what we want to get comfortable with. Um, if you Google with a common name, you're much more apt to get unreliable. Oh, and sources. I say that with houseplants all the time, too. Okay. I'm a big proponent for plant Latin. Yeah. 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 It's just like you got to know it. You, you got to know it. it. Yeah. You <laughs> Otherwise, you aren't going to know if, you know, Joe, who put up the, the blog post actually 
knows what plant he's talking about or yeah. if you're talking about that maybe he's talking about his version of totally. sheep sorrel and not your version of exactly. sheep sorrel. Yeah. And in the house plant community too, it's like there's three there's six different plants that are nicknamed the friendship plant. So how do you know mm-hmm. which one if you're reading a blog on the friendship plant? It's like well, that could be Pilea peperomioides, or that could be hen and chick succulents. Like, that could be so many different things. Hemlock, hemlock, and hemlock. Hemlock, hemlock. <laughs> and one of those puppies is going to kill you if yeah. you, you know? One of those, I have eastern hemlock on my yes. property, mm-hmm. which you were sh- teaching me, can be very medicinal and wonderful in the winter. But then also, other hemlock will kill you. So, right, right. Uh, be careful. <laughs> so then I feel like from this, it's like, okay, plant friends, get out there, get your key, go and learn and use the key and learn. Why don't we talk about a couple of, oh, let's talk about plant botany. So what are some botanical names that you feel like people should know and understand? Yeah. A lot of your plant keys mm-hmm. are going to start with the flower. So understanding the parts of a flower and basic floral arrangement is important. So uh, firstly, is a flower regular or irregular? Uh, and that's not just, you know, my insulting. The- right. <laughs> so does the flower have radial symmetry, which means we would call it regular? Or does it have bilateral symmetry, in which case we would call it irregular? Okay. And that refers to the petals being radial or, or in a bilateral symmetry or the petal-like parts. What does radial mean? So you could slice that flower any which way and have a mirror image. Any which way. Okay. So the radius. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. So So like like a a daisy daisy. Mm -hmm. would be an example of a regular flower. But a bilateral would be like Mint family flower. Okay. Because bilaterals, you can only cut it in one way. You can only cut it, yeah, one on one plane. And have a mirror image. You can't cut it horizontal and vertical and have a mirror image. I'm just looking at these snapdragons. Are snapdragons bilateral? Because correct. Okay, got it. Okay, cool. Correct. So mm-hmm. radial or bilateral for flowers. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Give us some more plant nerd. Terms. Yeah, yeah. And then understand what parts of that flower are the petals, which might seem obvious, but it's not always all that obvious. So the petals are typically going to be the showy part of the flower and they will surround the reproductive parts, which is the next part we want to know. And then the sepals are the secondary petal-like parts that cup the petals. Yes. And they are typically green, although not always. The petals collectively, we call the corolla. And the sepals collectively we call the calyx. And so these are terms that are going to come up in in your plant key, basically. So when, and once again, plant friends, you got to go look at my Instagram this week because there's so much information Heather is bestowing upon us with wonderful visuals. But you had showed me the dandelion that has, are those the sepals that you were saying that with the dandelion flower, you have to remove to break the flower up? Yes. So so technically we call those bracts. Now we're going to get a little... <laughs> get really granular about <laughs> but, it. But yes, but they act like sepals. Mm-hmm. Great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So we've got the symmetry of the flower. We've got the sepals. What else? Then we would want to consider the reproductive parts within the center of the flower. We don't always have to get deep into those, but it is still helpful to know kind of what they are, how to recognize them. So the male reproductive parts are called the stamens, and they will surround the pistil. And the pistil is the female reproductive part. And some flowers will be entirely male, some will be entirely female, uh, and some will many will contain both. And then once we understand that flower, and even those reproductive parts, they can come in handy too in kind of understanding what plants may be related to one another. So, you know, with... The rose family, you're always going to have many pistils and many stamens. So we wouldn't say that necessarily for many other families. So if you see a flower with many pistils and many stamens, it doesn't mean it's definitely a member of the rose family, but it very well could be. So that may be a place to look. Then we certainly want to understand the leaf arrangement on a flowering stalk. So are the leaves opposite or alternate on that stalk? So opposite would mean that they are in perfect pairs on the flowering stalk. And then alternate would mean that they're alternating up the stalk. And then you may also have whorled leaves, which would be kind of like um, the spokes on a wheel. So all of the leaves are originating 
from uh, Central Point around that flowering stalk. So your regular flower and your irregular flower and your leaf arrangement is going to be two of your most important aspects. And then are your leaves toothed? Are they entire? Are they lobed? Are they divided? So then we could take it a little bit deeper. So what is the leaf shape and what kind of leaf edge does it have or leaf margin? So the margin speaks to the edge of the leaf. So the margin could be toothed or serrated like a, like a saw. It could have prominent lobes like a bloodroot leaf or it could be entire like a, a blueberry leaf. Speaking of lobes, we had a big aha moment with clover. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the two different lobes for the two plants that we were comparing and contrasting? Yeah. So what we could say about clover is that clover has firstly a divided leaf or a compound leaf. You could use those terms interchangeably. So a compound leaf is going to be one leaf divided into segments. So in the case of clover and wood sorrel, three segments or three leaflets. So although we commonly kind of look at that, like, oh, it's got three leaves. It has three leaflets making up one leaf. Making up one leaf. Mm -hmm. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so clover's leaflets are entire. So they have a smooth edge. Whereas the leaflets on wood sorrel are lobed. Or we could also say that they're uh, chordate because they're like heart-shaped. Yeah, they're heart-shaped. That was Mm -hmm. the big thing because I was thinking my wood sorrel was clover, but then you pointed out that it's wood sorrel because the lobes or the leaflets are heart shaped versus the clover. Once again, we have the visuals on Instagram for you guys to enjoy. Yes. Yeah, that was kind of wild too because I think my whole life I've thought clover is clover and maybe it hasn't been, you know? (laughs) You look for the four leaf clover, but maybe I'm looking for four leaf. Well, maybe that's your common name too. I mean, Who's to say someone's wrong if they're calling wood sorrel clover? Right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So leaf shape. So it sounds like the flower symmetry and the leaf. What's the word for it? The location? Arrangement. The leaf arrangement and then the leaf shape. Those mm-hmm. three will get you pretty far. Yes, absolutely. And then you're into like the real little things. But I think that is a really great place to start because once again, Not that we keep talking about the dandelion, but the big differentiating factor for the dandelion and the hawkweed that you taught me today is the leaves are totally different. The hawkweed has lobe. Hawkweed has entire leaves. Entire leaves that are fuzzy. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then dandelion has these kooky, jagged leaves, toothed. So we would say they're they're lobed, but... It's variable. Very specific kind of arrow, <laughs> repeating arrowhead shape. Yeah. So for me, looking at those two plants, I really just need the leaf shape to, I feel like, really mm-hmm. differentiate as long as they're both blooming. Okay. So that's very interesting. Any other important botanical terms you feel like people need for a 101? I think it's a good amount. I think that's good. So then let's move over to, because this is also where my brain goes, okay, this is too much, herbalism talk. So expectorant. What are some of the other words that you put in here? But I mean, you can probably start just talking about them. But when you talk about the uses, you know, when I was asking you about all of these different plants that we were IDing, you would say it's this, which means it's good for your blood, or it's this, which means it's good for this. Plant friends, you might've heard there was a lawnmower in the back. Heather and I were having this beautiful interview on my deck with the birds chirping and the lawnmower came so uh which we're not in control of so we've we've readjusted you might hear some background noise of lawn mowing but i trust that the content is so good that you're just going to grit through it and we apologize so heather we were talking about herbalist terms so we talked about botanical names but when we're foraging for medicinal purposes what are some terms that we should know so that when we, you know, go to make a tincture or a salve or whatever, we understand the properties of, of the power of these plants? Sure, sure. So what you're likely to see in an explanation of how to use a plant medicinally are herbal action terms. So herbal actions basically tell us how the plant acts upon the body, what effects it is going to have in a general, general way. 
So an example of an herbal action would be a diuretic. So that's an herb that's going to increase urine output or an herb that is, uh, let's see, diaphoretic is going to increase the body temperature, encourage perspiration, and then a cool down. Okay. I remember when Juliet was on my show, she was talking about like heating versus cooling plants and like their properties as well, like plants that heat or cool you. So diaphoretic would be the one that heats you. And so she may have also been referring to herbal energetics. Yeah, I think that's what she was saying. Yeah, so herbal energetics are different from herbal actions. Okay. You can have two herbs that have the same action. So say two diuretic herbs, but one may be warming and one may be cooling. Okay. So the energetics of an herb is really kind of, we can usually sense that via our senses. So what the herb tastes like, perhaps even what it smells like or what it feels like in a cup of tea or on the tongue. So for example, an herb like plantain, common plantain is going to be moistening and cooling. And if you have ever nibbled, which I know you have, you nibbled earlier, nibbled a plantain leaf, it's got a slimy kind of quality to it. So it's quite clear how that would be like a moistening plant. A little bit trickier to sense the cooling aspect, but there's nothing spicy about it when you taste that leaf. And we consider it cooling because it's so cooling to to inflammation. Got it. Okay, cool. Yeah. So actions and energetics are, are two different ways in which we can understand the plants. Okay. The plants gifts. Well, you know what I'm thinking? Why don't we go through a few different plants that we forage today, but they're also plants that Heather chose them specifically because they're common in many areas. So if you're not living in, you know, the tri-state area like we are in New York slash Pennsylvania, hopefully you might be able to see them in route elsewhere around the country. And maybe we can just talk about their effects. Let's talk about dandelion and then maybe you can give those words and define them as we kind of move through the plants. Sure, sure. So I do feel like dandelion is probably the most common, the most famous of the, (laughs) you know, medicinal quote unquote weeds. So do you want to start with dandelion? Yeah. So dandelion, scientific name, Taraxacum officinale. That scientific name right there uh, tells us something about dandelion. So Taraxacum is the combination of two Greek words that mean disorder remedy. So when we named dandelion, we considered it the remedy for disorders. And then officinal or officinalis, which we see in numerous plant names, tells us that this is a plant that's long been considered medicinal. So that was the official plant used for X and X disorders. So dandelion, uh, we can use nearly every single part. The flowers are edible, but I do kind of consider them like the icing on the cake. Okay. What we could do is use the petals as a decorative piece, say in crepes, or we could uh, sprinkle them on a salad. And you're going to get some bioflavonoid content from those flowers. So any kind of colorful flowers speaks to the bioflavonoid content within them. And bioflavonoids are going to be uh, protective to our cardiovascular systems. And the leaves of dandelion, they are vitamin rich and have an affinity for the kidneys or the urinary tract. So we could have a tea of the leaves to increase urine output. So helpful for uh, situations like edema, urinary tract infections, simple cleansing of the blood. And then those leaves too, just their nutrient content, you know, food is medicine. So for giving our bodies what our bodies need, all of our bodily systems are going to function more efficiently. And then the root of dandelion has an affinity for the liver. So we could also make a tea of the root or we could even eat it as a food. They're quite tasty. Uh, Sauteed with a little bit of tamari and garlic. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but it's it will stimulate uh, liver, liver action. Okay. So essentially the detoxification of the body through the liver. Okay. Also through the digestion. So the dandelion root contains inulin, which is a uh, prebiotic that's going to help feed our healthy gut flora. Yeah. So just the dandelion alone kind of speaks to how plants work on a very holistic level. 
So it's, it's not as simple as say a pill that we take that's just going to affect one part of the body. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Every part of the plant affects a different part of the body. That's so Mm -hmm. cool. What about, I mean, we've talked about Sorel a lot in this conversation, so I do think we should give it some time to shine. The Sorel family, what do you have to say about them? Yeah. So actually we met uh, sheep sorrel and wood sorrel together, which are actually two unrelated plants. Okay. Oh, (laughs) I didn't realize that. Okay. So despite the fact that they both are lemony Uh and they both are called sorrel, um, sheep sorrel is Rumex acetosella and wood sorrel is um, various species of oxalis. Okay. Oxalis, which we grow as houseplants. Yes. Yes. Um, so sheep sorrel is a leaf with it's kind of like an arrowhead yes. shape, two little lobes typically, and it is chock full of vitamin C and would have a diuretic and blood cleansing property in quantity. And actually the same goes for wood sorrel. So even though they are two different very different plants. They do have similar actions. And wood sorrel is that leaf that is compound and made up of three heart-shaped leaf Right. Plants. Our clover friend. Our clover friend. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> I love it. What about plantain? Now, I asked you about plantain on my birthday. I asked you about plantain when you got here because Billy and I are obsessed with the show Alone. And Alone is a show where they like drop you in the wilderness and you have to survive. And the person that survives the longest wins. And it's just fascinating. We're obsessed with it. And they're always talking about plantain on the show. I don't know if it's because where they get dropped, they see plantain a lot, or if it's just a common plant, you know, in many different areas. But can you tell us a little bit about plantain and its properties? Yeah. So plantain is a very common weed. And actually wood sorrel and sheep sorrel are as well. So com- those are really common to pop up in your garden. But so is plantain, very common lawn, lawn weed, actually. And plantain is one of our very best vulnerary herbs. That's another one of those words. Yeah. yeah. So a vulnerary herb is an herb that is going to uh, heal tissue. Plantain can heal tissue both internally and externally. So externally, simplest way to use plantain is just to take that broad green leaf, if we're speaking about Plantago major, which is the common broadleaf plantain. We could also use English plantain, which is going to have more of a lance-shaped leaf. But either one, take that leaf, chew it up, spit it out, making a spit and chew poultice, and then apply that to a bug bite, a bee sting, a cut to scrape, what yeah. have you. Yeah. I love that application because I'm constantly getting bug bites and getting such swelling and irritation. So the thought that if I have a party, I have lawn pond parties, I could just chew up some plantain and pop it on a bug bite and keep partying. That's helpful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then we could even get a little more elaborate, but still quite simple. Uh, you could harvest a good many plantain leaves, dry them or nearly dry them. They can be wilted and then tear them apart, break them into small pieces, what have you, and put them into a glass mason jar. Pack them in well, and then cover them over with extra virgin organic olive oil. Mm, Okay. Yeah. And then allow those to infuse for, I'd say one to two or, or maybe even three weeks, and then strain out the plant matter using a cheesecloth, retain the olive oil, and now you've got a plantain infused olive oil that you can also use in healing bug bites, bee stings, or just in moisturizing the skin. So plantain is great for cracked, dry, scaly skin cool. as well. Or Make sunburn. your own skincare. Mm-hmm. I love mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Plantain, I feel like, wasn't the most delicious of the things we we tasted, but it was a very particular bitter experience. (laughs) Well, and internally eating plantain, or we could just make a tea of plantain. So if it's not that, that mucilaginous quality, which means it's, it gets kind of slimy when it gets wet. If that doesn't appeal to you, you could also just make a tea and add a little bit of honey or add some lemon. And you're not going to pick up on that quality as much. I mean, no more than you might on like a, a cup of chamomile tea. That also has a little bit of that demulcent or kind of slimy quality about it. But you could have a cup of plantain tea and that would be very healing to tissue, say, within the esophagus. You know, if you had heartburn, 
mm. uh, or an ulcer, mm. also healing to the intestinal tract. So that same kind of slimy quality that you feel on your tongue will also travel down through your intestinal tract and line the intestines as well. Wow. Um, reducing okay. inflammation therein. Interesting. Dang. Of course, that's why everybody likes plantain out in the wilderness. And then last but not least, because we discovered I have, I am rich with yarrow in my backyard, which I didn't realize. Um, Can we talk a little bit about yarrow? Oh, yes. Yarrow is just one of my favorite plants. Scientific name is Achillea millifolium. And Achillea actually speaks to Achilles. So there's lore surrounding uh, yarrow that he would have his soldiers wash in yarrow before or after really? going into battle for protection. Wow. Okay. It's also said that uh, Achilles' mother bathed him in yarrow to protect him. Mm. As a baby. Okay. However, she made that fatal mistake of holding him by the heel. Yes, yes, yeah. of course. <laughs> and then millifolium speaks to the many little leaflets that make up each leaf on Yarrow. Oh, they're so beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's another identifying feature with yarrow. But yarrow is one of our very best first aid plants. So it too is going to be vulnerary, healing to tissue, but in a very different way from plantain. So it is drying rather than moistening. Mm, okay. Yeah. So very good if you had, say, oozy poison ivy or condition of, let's see, so a lot of excess mucus and a sore throat, or excess phlegm, I should say, and a sore throat. A yarrow tea could be helpful in in that way. So we use the flowers, we use the leaves, either or, and we could steep those in hot water for, for tea. That will be both internally great, as I said, for healing mucosa, Or externally, we could use that tea as a wash for cuts and scrapes, you know, uh, mild abrasions. Yarrow is highly antimicrobial. So it's antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral. So that will reduce an infection that may be brewing or reduce the likelihood of an infection. So yarrow, you know, even if, if you don't have your pot or a way to heat water, Say you're out in the back country again, just like plantain, take a leaf, chew it up, spit it out. Makes a great, great poultice. Great for poison ivy. To wrap up, I love the story that you shared with me offline about you were on a retreat and someone got poison ivy. And so you created like a very cool mud wrap. For, yeah. Was yarrow part of that? Yarrow was, was actually not part of that. Yeah. And it was um, Juliet's program. Yeah, it was Juliet's <laughs> program. Yes. So what we did was we collected uh, violet leaves, cinquefoil leaves, and wild strawberry leaves. And we made a very strong tea, or more accurately speaking, like an infusion. We used equal parts water and plant. Okay. And then we strained out the plant matter and gathered dirt from the forest and put that in the infusion. And then we made, it ended up being like a medicinal mud. So then the, the young man who had suffered poison ivy then applied that to his poison ivy rash and it was helpful. And then and then we were all enjoying using that same mud on our many insect bites. <laughs> I bet, yeah. I bet. Oh my gosh, so cool. This is so fascinating and I hope that you'll come back in the future because I feel like we've just scratched the surface. I love to talk about tinctures and solves, but we've like just scratched the surface on foraging. You have so many cool offerings for people who might want to dive deeper and get a little bit more enrichment. So can you share where people can find you, follow you, learn from you, get on that email list? What do you what do you have going on? Absolutely. Yeah. So I've launched a school this spring called the School of Plant and Place Connection. It's such a cool concept what oh, you're doing. Thank you. Yeah. And it's located, it is in person, located in Milford, Pennsylvania. Most all of our time together is out in the field and in the forest. And uh, starting this coming spring, so 2024, I'll be doing an immersion program in which we'll meet one weekend a month and then do some Zoom meetups in between. And that will be a comprehensive herbal medicine and foraging program. So cool. Yeah. And you might hear Milford, Pennsylvania and be like, where is that? But it's literally less than two hours from New York City. Centrally located yeah, between centrally New York located. and New Jersey, yeah, the northeastern corner of the state. And then I've also got shorter programs going on, a series with the School of Plant and Place Connection. And as the botanical hiker, 
I've been uh, doing group programs, herbal medicine programs for about 15 years now. So I've always got um, public walks happening with nonprofits and hiking clubs. And let's see, at the end of September, I'll be going out upstate New York to speak at the North Country Trail Conference. Cool. So you can find me lots of different places. Check out the botanicalhiker.com for the uh, public events. And then if you're interested in learning more about the school or attending, uh, check out schoolofplantandplaceconnection.com. Cool. And yeah, I'd say get on her email list because then you sound like a monthly email or something. I'm on your email list. Yeah, yeah. It's about monthly. Yeah, so usually I'll not send out what I've got. Not at all. <laughs> but you can send out, you know, if you're interested in potentially learning from Heather, get on her email list so you can be kept abreast of all the different things you're doing. Because even on your Instagram, it's like you're doing a salve class here. You're doing a lecture here. I met you at Woodlock. Highly recommend people doing weekend aways at Woodlock. It's incredible. And the Botanical Hegler on socials. We'll link to everything. And plant friends, I don't try and be annoying about my Instagram on this podcast. I know a lot of people don't do Instagram, but Heather just walked around my property with me for an hour and a half and broke down how to identify so many different plants. It was so fun. Special thanks to my friend, Sarita, who recorded it. So go to my Instagram and get educated as a companion to this episode because it was so amazing. I mean, it's such an unbelievable mind. I mean, you just, you the retention and how you can just call back all these, you can just spit out all of these interesting pieces of information about every single plant on my lawn. It's incredible. Well, it's easy when it's something that you love. Yes, and you clearly are so passionate. So thank you. I hope this is the first of many conversations. Thank you, Maria. Yeah, and um, go check Heather out. Thanks. Thank you so much, Heather. I feel so lucky to have made her my plant friend. And I feel thankful to the Lodge at Woodlock for hiring her. When you stay at the Lodge at Woodlock, their courses, like their education is free. So this was one of many classes I took that day. Her book is so good. We're going to link to it. If you live in the Northeast, you should totally get the book that we talked about. We're going to link to all of her other books, her social media, join her mailing list so you can join maybe her courses that she offers that are upcoming. And definitely go check out my social Instagram, Growing Joy with Maria. There is where we're going to be releasing the videos that we created in companionship to this episode so you can have beautiful visuals and learn even more about the specific plants that we kind of skated the surface on today. I hope this episode inspires you to get outside, plant friends. Go look around in your yard and see if you can identify any of these plants. Wear your sunscreen, (laughs) wear sun protection, but go get outside. I hope this episode inspires you to cultivate a deeper relationship with nature, the plants that are sitting right under our nose at some times. A growing joy thought is also, you know, we categorize these plants as weeds, but why are we doing that? They're medicinal, they're healing, they're native. They were here before we were, right? And when we think about that, where else in our life are we maybe branding something the wrong way? And we can have an opportunity to reframe and see how something that we've branded as negative can actually be healing for us. And with that thought, my plant friends, I hope you have beautifully planted weeks. Until next time, keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss an episode. We have incredible episodes lined up in 2023, and I don't want you to miss one topic. And while you're subscribing, would you mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review? Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so I thank you in advance for helping this podcast reach as many planty earbuds as possible across the globe. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got a ton of free options for you. First, there's the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's so fun. It takes literally three minutes to complete. You take the test, you get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you, inspired by your results. The link is in the show notes. Make sure to let me know what your personality is after you take the test. 
If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, check out my website. We've got a bunch of free guides that you can download on topics like understanding natural light, which is actually a three-day worksheet, and nine ways to clean up your office if you need to bring a little bit of planty joy into your work life. And finally, I want to invite you to join the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet, my online garden society. It's both a web platform and an iOS and Android app. It allows our listeners to get together in an algorithm and troll-free online space to swap plant care tips, humble brag about plant wins, and get support when you have plant fails. We have monthly live planty show and tells on Zoom, which are so fun, and even have a living library of planty book recommendations sourced from our community. You can go to jointhegardensociety.com to grab your membership. And for anything else, plant friend, I am here for you. Feel free to drop me a line, whether you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe you're even a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, following me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and tips is always recommended. You can find me across socials at Growing Joy with Maria. Thank you again so much for listening. It is truly my honor and life's delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast.